Hey, welcome back, everybody. Another week up North Journal Live tonight. Man, we got a good show tonight for you. Yes, we do. Weather's I, changing I, and everything. Oh, man. It's getting good. A little thunderstormy today. Yeah, yeah. 85 today, 65 tomorrow. Yep. I'm telling you, the winds have changed. Well, speaking of some change, let's get this thing on the road so we can talk about some change. All right. Here we go. Stand by. Three, two, and one. Welcome back to another episode of the Edmark Journal, everybody. Host Mike Adams sitting in the cabin tonight with none other than Dan DeFall sitting on the, the front edge of a cold front that's coming through. We the are. Nice deer season is on the way. Right. And we're a week and a half away from the official start of bow hunting here in Michigan. Yep. We've had a couple small seasons, youth, liberty. Uh, we had an early, early antlerless last week. Yep. Um, but, uh, man, week and a half. It's going to be game on. on. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, get some people some savings here and get our sponsorship out of the way. Absolutely. Uh, i tell you what, folks. So this close to deer season, if you haven't already checked out Buck Bates, go to buckbaits.com. I was at the brick and mortar store today at deer camp talk to julie uh and if you use the promo code unj20 you get 20 percent off your order at buckbaits.com don't forget the easy cuts get 15 percent off with unj15 off go to easycutproducts.com check them out clear away right to your stand uh it's never too late to talk to lincoln Rowan over at packer max get 25 dollars off your order unj25 packermax.com give lincoln a call well, we're talking about bow, but is it ever really a bad time to go over to the Island Armory and check out their gun selection? Never. Right. <laughs> and if you want 10% off, use UNJ10, get 10% off your order. Like I said, check out their site. It changes daily. You need that goose call, that squirrel call. You need maybe a deer grunt, a deer call. grunt call. Go to jpogamecalls.com, use the uh, code UNJ10, get 10% off your order. We've had them on the show, uh, Miller Deer Tracking. They're going to give you 20% off. If you need their help, make give them a call. Uh, use the code UNJ20. He'll give you 20% off that tracking of your needs uh, when you're looking help for help for that deer. But don't forget, it might be fall hunting season everywhere, but don't forget Southern Indiana Bait Co. Uh, go down to their website. Check out their, their uh, lures that they have, and if you want 10% off, Use the code UNJ10. You get 10% off your order there. And last but not least, uh, Deer Camp Coffee. Like I said, I was there today. I picked up a bag of Bada Boom cannoli flavored, folks. That's right. I'm going to try cannoli fa flavor. I bought uh, Mike Pumpkin Spice because it's the season. Don't forget, use the promo code UNJ10. Get 10% off your order at DeerCampCoffee.com. And don't forget to get a bag of UNJ coffee, our own medium roast label there. So, weather's cold, but how cold is it right now up north? Where are we going tonight? We are going up to where it is a nice, balmy 58 degrees in Newberry, Michigan. That's right, 58. And if you go over to Cedars, you get some pizza and some Deer Camp coffee, and you can have it up there in the UP of Michigan. And we're carried on 123 FM up in Newberry. There you go, folks. Well, let's not waste any time. I'm excited about tonight's show, and I'm excited about having tonight's guest here. And we want to welcome none other than Kip Adams from the National Deer Alliance Association. Kip, thank you for coming on the show tonight. Hey, thanks, guys. I'm glad to be here. It is awesome time of the year. You know, uh, it's a, the special time. We're sitting on cold fronts. We're waiting on these big uh, fronts to move through and weather change to get these deer moving and get into the tree stand or in a ground blind of some sort. Uh, it's got to be exciting where you're at, too. Absolutely. Uh, here in northern Pennsylvania, we've been having some, some cool nights. It's in the 40s every night for the last couple of weeks. Uh, one night dipped down into the high 30s. So uh, I can definitely feel, you know, that crisp uh, air. We're still in the 70s during the day, so it's nice and warm. Still a lot of folks wearing shorts. People are still wearing shorts doing some habitat work or, <laughs> or setting blinds. But uh, those cool mornings let you know that, uh, you know, it, uh, it is almost here. Our bow season doesn't open until October 1st. Uh, we're one of the later ones to get going. But uh, I'll say for, for me and my kids' standpoint, uh, we are chomping at the bit. Uh, October can't get here soon enough. 
Amen to that. That is definitely for sure. Uh, and you know what? It, it's you get that 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 cold, cool morning, and, and as we get into the fall, and you start to see the leaves change. And I tell you, you're right. You just start itching. It's like you get up, you start to look at the deer. I know some of the deer on my camera up in the UP that they, you know, they're they're switching over their coats and everything. Yeah. And it's well, like it's like it's like the week before Christmas. It we, is. We can see the presents under the tree. We know it's coming, but we just got to wait till that opening morning. Well, instead of opening presents, we're, it's opening day for us, so uh, I'm pumped. You know, and, and we're having you on today uh, for the National Deer Association, and congratulations on your 20th year there, QDMA mm -hmm. slash National Deer Association. How's it feel to be there 20 years? Oh, uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, it doesn't, I don't feel old enough to have been there for 20 years yet. It, uh, let's say this, it's been a great ride. Um, Whitetail Deer and, and this organization have taken me you know, across North America to places that uh, I could have only or never imagined having gone. So uh, I'm very fortunate to, to, to work for the NDA, very fortunate to uh, have got to see and travel and meet all the great hunters and deer managers across this country. So uh, I'm, I'm very blessed and uh, it, it has gone by way too quickly. It's, it's hard to believe it's 20 years. I know, right? You know, it, it, and that's with any job, it seems like, you know, before you know it, you've been there. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. I've had a few guys at work finally retire. They're in the 40s, 45-year uh, range, and it's like, wow. You know, but if you enjoy what you do, you know, you're going to be it and love it there. But uh, you said something just before we went on the show that you are happy that ha something happened today at the National Deer Association uh, that was unexpected that we are going to talk about. But go ahead and talk about what you guys started, uh, kicked off today. Oh yeah, we're uh, certainly big in the R3 movement, you know, uh, into to recruiting new hunters and, you know, because we know that our hunter numbers are, you know, are declining, hunters are getting older, you know, they certainly aren't replacing them, you know, like when you guys were young or when I was young, you know, everybody hunted and it's very different to today and we all know that. So a lot of, of uh, you know, conservation organizations and, and state wildlife agencies, you know, look at the R3 movement to try to, you know, recruit new hunters and reactivate hunters. Uh, well, from our end of it, we are super proud of our, what we call our field to fork program, where uh, we take adults who, who want to learn how to hunt, you know, maybe didn't grow up in a hunting family like I did or like you guys did, that later in life decide, I would love to do this. Well, you guys know it's, it's a lot harder to start hunting than it is a lot of other things. Like, if you want to learn to play golf when you're older, you, know, you can buy a book, you can watch YouTube videos. It's easy to get into golf or <laughs> right. bowling or whatever. Hunting is very different. So our Field to Fork program uh, mat or takes uh, people, adults, who want to learn to hunt, and uh, we match them with a mentor who can teach them how to do that, you know, how to be able to go a field, how to you know, find deer, how to field dress deer, all that. So anyway, today is a special day for us because we recently signed a contract with the Pennsylvania Game Commission to hire a field to fork coordinator who will work in Pennsylvania and her job is every day is to facilitate field to fork hunts, provide opportunities for you know hunters who want to learn but don't have somebody to take them to actually match them with somebody to be able to take them. So there are a lot of very lucky aspiring hunters today uh, in, the, in the Keystone State who over the course of the next year are going to get an opportunity to go hunting because of this uh, great hire that we had that starts today. So we're super excited about that. You know, we talked with uh, Chad Stewart, deer biologist here in Michigan, DNR, uh, a couple weeks back, and we were talking about the recruitment and the retention uh, and the reactivation of, of the hunters here in Michigan, uh, the three R's like you're talking about. But he said they're focusing on uh, kind of like the millennials, that, that 20 to 30 age range because – you know, he said, it's hard to get the young kids to go because if they're not already going, they don't have anybody to take them, and it, it kind of, there's kind of a, a, a gap there. So they're, they're looking at the, the people who are young enough to get out, have the money to get out, uh, to learn, but also when they have kids, and the, the, hopefully they'll bring them up. Are you seeing, doing the same thing or seeing this, kind of the same things across the country in, in Pennsylvania? Absolutely. Yep, okay. absolutely. And, you know, we have done a lot of youth events over the years, and a lot of people have, you know, and you feel great about them. But at the end of the day, you know, a youth hunter can't take himself hunting or herself hunting mm -hmm. or go buy a bow or a gun or camouflage. So there's nothing wrong with youth events, and we continue to do a bunch of them. But what we realize is if we really want to move the needle, you need to start doing this with adults. 
And uh, it is incredible the number of college age kids today who want to do this. And then uh, folks even older than college age. So yeah, we, uh, from the adult hunting end, we start focusing in on as soon as somebody you know is able to drive and take himself or herself, you know, and be able to certainly once they're out of college, now they start having the means to you know to purchase a gun or a bow and mm -hmm. the camouflage and the license. Uh, and the cool thing is, you know, if we teach them, they not only then can go, but they are far more likely than to also mentor somebody else, either take a youth, mm -hmm. you know, or take another adult. Uh, perfect example, we have a, a place there in Michigan, you know, the Back 40, uh, started by Mark Kenyon from yep. Meat Eater. Yeah, you know, they donated yeah. it to us a year ago. We had our first field of fork hunts on that last year. Mark was there. He's a great personal friend and a great friend of the organization. He mentored, you know, uh, one of the hunters. Well, anyway, fast forward one year now, last weekend was the second year of it. And every single person that we had there hunting shot a deer last weekend. Nice. Including the first two who were mentored by people who were mentees last year. So you know, they awesome. shot their first deer last year. They came back and are mentoring and sharing, you know, what they know this year. And so... Pretty, uh, pretty cool that everybody that hunted there last weekend shot a deer, or shot a doe, and uh, two of them were taken by people being mentored by folks who shot their first deer there last year at this time. So that is just super exciting. A great thing, you know, for the future of hunting. A great thing, you know, for people who think, man, maybe I'd like to do this. Hey, yeah, there's folks out there willing to take you, willing to share their time, and their experience. So, um, yeah, that's that's very cool and. You know, my tip of the hat goes off, you know, to Michigan where this property is and where there are so many willing mentors. That is awesome. Well, that's that's also important as stewards of the land and in the hunting community that we are able to do that. Like Mark, like you said, the 40 acres, you know, has said, hey, let's let's do it. You know, sharing our experiences and not being that closed minded. I'm not going to tell you where I'm going to kill my deer. Yeah. You know, I'm right. not going to show you. But more times than not in the hunting community, it seems like we're more than gracious enough. Somebody raises their hand and says, hey, I want to try it. Most of the time, we're always like, hey, let's figure out a time. Let's place and make it happen. And I see you've had over 107 of those Fields of Fork events hosted by NDA since your programs in session. And also, uh, the 17 million acres that has been packed by the NDA. I tell you what, it, it, people, you got to go over to the DeerAssociation.com uh, website and check them out. Look page through it. They got a lot of great articles. They even got some podcasts over there. And then you can learn more about how the Deer Association is working. And they're even engaged in policies annually, uh, over 200 there. Um, you know, t a little bit about that. Uh, you're pretty much uh, where it's needed for in you're going to all the states, correct? It is. Yep. So uh, we work with uh, with all the state wildlife agencies. Um, we have great friends at, at Michigan DNR and, and have worked very closely with your agency for a number of years. And uh, so that's great for the agency. You know, it's great for the hunters of the state. Um, certainly good for our NDA members within those states. But, uh, you know, we like to be good friends. We like to be, have good partnerships uh, because that, that just helps the resource. It helps our hunting opportunities. Absolutely. And since we, we just talked about policies, we're going to go to our first break, but we're going to come back. We're going to talk about a policy here in Michigan called mandatory deer check. <laughs> and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think we can talk a long time about that. Yeah. All right. right. We're going to step outside. We'll take our first break. We'll be right back after this. All right, everybody, get your questions in if you got them. Uh, I saw Tammy Delk uh, mentioned that she started hunting later in life in 2015. So she was mentored, and now she is out there. Uh, in the outdoors as well. Right, exactly. It, you know what? Uh, it, it's one of those things when you get somebody willing to, to get out there and learn, listen. I mean, it is. it becomes making memories, as we always talk about. Absolutely. And, and I see Kip always posting on his Facebook page. Uh, he's all over the place. And, you know, it's all those memories that are created, whether you're a new hunter, old hunter, and, and whatnot. All right. So stand by. Come back in here in three, two, and one. All right, second segment. Before we went to the break, we talked about the new policy here in Michigan. Exactly. Uh, this year for the first time, well, for the first year of mandatory deer check here in Michigan this year, uh, they've come out with an app or you can go online to fill out your registration if you, if you harvest, kill a deer. Um, but Kip, talking to you before the show, 
Pennsylvania's been doing this a long time. Am I correct? That's correct. Yep. Uh, Pennsylvania and, uh, and a whole bunch of other states uh, have, have mandatory requirements for mandatory harvest registration. I tell you what, I guess Michigan's better late than never. Right? Well, you know, speaking of that, I've got the report. We just dialed this up before we went on tonight. 7.06 p.m. It is 9,672. We did have a antlerless hunt over the weekend. Over the weekend. So is tonight at midnight is the last time. Yeah, yeah right? well, whatever, 72 hours from yeah. 8, whatever the Okay, so we're going to we're gonna see if it updates. Right, exactly. So, so in Pennsylvania, how are your deer hunting folk accepting mandatory gear check? Is it is it now just a normal thing, or did it take a little bit, or did you have to do some prodding to get them to do it, or or how did how did your what's your take on that in Pennsylvania? Yeah, the vast majority of hunters here um, have never hunted at a time when you didn't have to report. So it's just wow. that's just always been the rule. Um, you know, I started hunting when I was 12 in 1982. Uh, at that time, you couldn't hunt before that, and uh, it was a rule then. And uh, so I don't even – I have never hunted a, at a time in Pennsylvania when you didn't have to report. So it's just always been a rule. Now, having said that, not everybody, you know, uh, reports the way that they should, but it is required here. And there's different states, you know, that, that go after this different ways. So like in Michigan, where in the past you didn't have to – some people will say, well, you, you can't get a good accurate estimate of the number of deer that are shot. And, and, and actually, that's not true. Some states do it like Pennsylvania always did, where, hey, you have to report. Some states do it like Michigan used to, where you don't have to. And then after the season, the state wildlife agency would survey a subset of the hunters to be able to estimate the actual deer kill. Mm -hmm. And those can be very, very accurate. So there's different ways to go about it. However, one of the big advantages if you do require mandatory checking is, just like you just said, Mike, you know right now how many deer have been killed already. Mm -hmm. That is incredibly valuable data for the hunters to know and for your state wildlife agency to have. You know, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, here in Michigan, uh, it was a three-year uh, span that they would take information from one and two and then the third year, because we didn't have it, they would take a swag at it and say, okay, we're going to be about here, and then go from there. But like you said, as we see it here on the app, from now on, uh, after the season, I'll say February 1st, I think that's when all the seasons are over. So February 3rd, three days after the season closes, everything should be in. Right, Kip? That, I mean, you should right. have those numbers like, okay, we can start planning our, yeah. our yearly deer whatever more that's right. correctly. Yep, and you know, and you guys are even ahead of where we are in Pennsylvania now because even though we require reporting, um, we don't have the ability to do you know provide in-season harvest estimates like you guys can. So in Pennsylvania, everybody has to report. Pennsylvania Game Commission gets all the data, they have it all in, they analyze it, interpret it, and they make it available to the public in April of the year following the hunting season. So that is way before they have to start looking at season setting for the next year. But our season ends, you know, mid-January. We still have to wait a few months. The way it used to be in Michigan with the survey that you did after the season, literally that data was not all compiled and analyzed and given to your deer team until June or July. Right. So that is way too late. You need that data done and analyzed so that the DNR or the deer biologist can talk about it and so that you can share it with the public in the spring. Mm -hmm. So that you can make proposals for the fall, public can comment on them. That's the way it's supposed to work. It works that way in Pennsylvania because the data is done by April. But you guys are even late years ahead of us now because literally three days after your deer season ends, you have the data. So this is a monumental step forward for the DNR. And this is a huge boom for all the hunters in Michigan. This is a really, really good thing for you guys. Well, they're even breaking it down county, uh, county by county, and they'll give you the totals for antlered and antlerless deer within that county, that breakup. Uh, you know, and with what you're saying about how our system is set up now, are, is this going to be the, the future moving forward for other states? Is this going to be a model, or do we, do we have other states that currently have something that may be just a little more robust? I don't know of anybody that has a better system than you have right now. Okay. Okay. Um, I, we said, you know, I've been with, with the NDA for 20 years. Prior to that, I was the state of New Hampshire 
a deer and bear biologist. So I work for New Hampshire Fish and Game. New Hampshire Fish and Game still has one of the best uh, deer management programs in the country, mandatory checking. So I, as the deer biologist, I would get weekly updates throughout the whole season. And then during the season, I was always writing memos out to our department and to all the hunters. Hey, here's where we are today. Here's how many deer we've shot in each of the counties. Here's how we compared it to last year. So that was like the gold standard. Mm -hmm. uh, they continue with that today, and they do great. However, you guys are even ahead of that. So I, I don't know what every single state does. I'll admit that. But I know what most of them do, and I do not know of a single state that has a better system than what you guys just implemented right now. So I can completely see other states looking at this and wanting to model this going forward simply because you have real-time data, mm -hmm. which is especially important. Think of your CWD zones where, you know, hey, we want to harvest X number of analyst deer here. Mm -hmm. A lot of hunters are shy to do that because, man, well, they don't want to over-harvest. Well, you literally know at any point during it, we have 100 does, we have 200, five, or whatever the case is. Right. So you have real-time data that can implement or influence hunter decisions in those units. So what you guys have now is the gold standard. I wish we had that in Pennsylvania. Well, you know, along with that, you know, it, that you played right into what I was getting ready to, to ask about was using this tool uh, for doe management. I've got to, I got to think that this is going to help with herd management as far as maybe enticing more people to uh, take doe in certain areas uh, where they where they need them taken out. By, by seeing the, these numbers in a real time, like you were saying, don't you believe? Absolutely, because you guys know how it is. Um, <laughs> maybe you hunt a couple of days, you don't see anything, you go down to the coffee shop and you know, the rumor is, oh, we're not seeing anything. Oh, it's because they shot all those deer, you know, five miles away. They, they killed 10 and they killed 20. They get, so suddenly, now you're less likely to shoot a doe because you've heard they're killed. Well, it's all rumor. Mm -hmm. And so now all that goes out the window. Hey, here's how many we've shot. So I think it's it can absolutely help people who are not sure if they want to shoot a doe or not to go ahead and you know and take one mm -hmm. uh, if that's needed. And at the same time, it helps people realize you know what um, maybe I choose to shoot this buck, maybe I choose to pass this deer, but I'm making the decision on what my value system is, what I want to do, and I have real data. I'm not listening to the rumor mill, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's going on at the local bar or at the local coffee shop. So. I think it's going to be good for hunters, and it's going to be tremendous for the agency going forward, which then helps them make better uh, proposals and management decisions, which ultimately is better for hunters. Well, like like it happened this year, uh, the NRC voted and, and they made some recommendations. They, they they made the changes, and then the data came out afterwards, like you talked mm -hmm. about, and it was like people were. You, you even did a story on it. Um, that's what tipped me off that you knew a little bit about this. But mm -hmm. it was like, you know, so after this year, now that we have this system, that should never happen again. Like, like we talked about that, we're going to have the date in Michigan in the spring by J June, whenever the DNR makes their recommendations, the NRC, NRC should make sound science decisions. <laughs> should. Right? <laughs> should. Okay. That's it. Exactly right. And hunters now get to be better engaged in that process. Because the DNR can provide that data early in the year for hunters to see, to comment on. Then that gives the, the agency an opportunity to, you know, uh, explain what the proposals are, defend them if need be. Mm -hmm. But it allows hunters to be part of that whole process, which which hunters absolutely should be engaged in it. So well, well that's that you're absolutely Good. right because if, if at the end of the season I'm going to go look in my Iron County up in the UP of Michigan and I'm going to take a look at what was what was set out, you know, because for years in Iron County in the UP, uh, they said we didn't have enough deer. Maybe in the northern zone of me of my county, but where I was, I was knee deep in deer, and I'm like, please. And it took them ten years to figure it out to say I could shoot one. So hopefully. You know, we can get that resolved in this information. And speaking of getting engaged, uh, one of the questions is, uh, like in Indiana, where can they find, like, uh, the collab collaboration with the uh, Deer Association, maybe um, in Indiana? Can we go to the website and find a spot where we could find a local branch in Indiana? Sure can. Yep, you can go to our website, which actually is completely revamped as of uh, about two weeks ago. Um, yes, they can go there. 
search, yep. click on Indiana, find our branch network so that they can see, hey, here's the branches, here's the contact bo- or the people from the volunteers there. So, yep, they absolutely can do that. There you go. I brought it up as you, as you spoke. I c- clicked on Indiana. You got the Indiana Heartland branch, Purdue University branch, the Southern Indiana QDMA branch. So there you go, Mark. Uh, get a hold. If you're close to one of those, you can probably give them a call. They're probably going to be hosting some events here come springtime. That's usually when uh, the, the events are held. But, um, you know, it, it's that getting the states involved, uh, like here in Michigan, having you come over and support what's ever going on, it, it just makes this system so much easier. Uh, to go with that. You know, so, I, I saw the link on there. It said the Southern Indiana QDMA branch. Uh, now, y- y'all have joined forces. I mean, it's basically National Deer Alliance now, right? Deer Na- National Deer Association. Uh, Association, I'm sorry. National yep, Deer Association. Uh, are, are they still working hand-in-hand hand with uh, st- the local co-ops, like on a, on a state level and down to the, the local level? Y'all still got a yep. hand in that? We sure do, and, uh, and we have some employees uh, in, in Missouri specifically that, that work every day with those cooperatives, similar to the, the shared position we used to have in Michigan. Yep. So, yes, we're still big fans of co-ops. We still work with them on a very regular basis. We still continue to produce new educational materials, videos, etc., to help them be successful. Um, so we're big believers in the value of co-ops. And uh, so, yes, we're, we're big fans. We continue to work with them. You know, I always hear people still talking about QDMA, uh, and they use that interchangeably along with the NDA. And I just want to make sure to get that point out yeah. as well. Uh, and actually, we miss both of the, of the gals who worked on the state level here. We, we yeah. worked with them quite a bit, and uh, we, we need somebody like that back here again pushing for our co-ops. Right, exactly. So, you know, just people out there, you want to get involved in this whole big picture, start with your local branches. You know, in your area, in your state, uh, Mark, you're in Indiana. We're here in Michigan. Um, Denny in uh, Illinois. Uh, you know, that's where it starts. It starts at at home, and uh, it's fun to meet people. And obviously, when you meet people, what do you do? You talk about deer hunting. And there's usually a cookout involved, right? <laughs> and there might be a, a few uh, beverages along the way. I won't say what kind, but there might be right? a few of those as well. <laughs> So I tell you what, we'll bump it up here. Let's, let's go get to a break because we got a couple more questions. Uh, we'll take our next uh, break, and we'll be right back after this. There you go. All right, keep those questions coming in. I see them here. We're going to roll down them. Because we're on a time deadline tonight, folks. And by the way, Kip, when we get to the end, and we'll, we'll, we'll let you go so you can get to your, uh, your meeting, uh, we'll just let you sign off. We'll continue with the show so you, that way you don't have to worry about it. We'll, we'll just continue to run on. Okay. Make it easy for you tonight. We appreciate you taking the time and, and hanging with us for a little while. No, my pleasure. Uh, it's good to see you guys, and uh, oh. I'm always, always glad to talk deer. You know what? That's, that's one of the good things. You know, when we first met you and we sat with you and we got to talk to you for that hour and, and what listen to you speak, you know, it speaks volumes having you on the show and, and, you know, developing that friendship that we have that we can give you a shout and have you come on and talk deer. We'll get some of these specific questions that are more just general deer questions and things uh, at the, in the last segment. Okay. We're going to touch something. Uh, I know you got a couple questions pertaining about the, the mandatory deer check right. specifically. Yep. All right. Here we go. Three, two, and one. All right. We're back. Third segment of the show. And uh, before we took off, we're talking about this mandatory deer check. Which they've had in Pennsylvania for years. So we're, we're, we're having mm-hmm. Kip come onto the show to ease everybody's you know give them a yep. little medicine hey, it's gonna be okay guys a little pat yeah. on the back the biggest thing we need kip we, we got to make sure that the opening weekend of firearm deer season here in michigan that the state site does not crash <laughs> <laughs> and if it does there's gonna be trouble i, I just Ooh. has that ever happened that you know of to, to any of these people that kick these off I don't know that it has, but hey, just the fact that there's at least the potential because you have that many hunters, that many people in the woods killing that many, how awesome is that? It is. It's not like we're a a podunk state where there's all of 100 people and they might shoot one deer today. (laughs) Yeah, right. How cool is it you have that many people going hunting? Yep. That, you know what, there's potential that it's going to crash the Internet. I think that's awesome. Well, the Total Archery Challenge did that this year. They had a whole new system, a whole new server to sign up for these big mountain archery shoots. 
and every the first three of them, uh, every state when they kicked off, they crashed the site. Mm. So, have you ever been to a total archery challenge? I have not. Oh, I'm no, a big bow hunter, so uh, I think I would like that. I, I tell you what, got one. you and your family would enjoy it. They would love it. So it's a blast. It is a blast. But um, we'll talk about that at another time. But as we get into this mandatory gear, one of the biggest things, actually there's a couple, one of the biggest things that people are having angst about is telling the DNR their location. Um, in the app, you go in, they're going to ask you for coordinates, and you can drop a pin. Uh, like Chad Stewart said, they had one shot in Mexico. They've had a few Lake swim Michigan. In, swimming in Lake, Lake <laughs> Michigan. But should people really be fearful that, you know, by dropping a pin at an intersection or somewhere close in the area, they, I really they don't have to put it right right there, but they could actually go to the intersection because you can move the pin around anywhere you want, and they know if you did or didn't touch it, they said. So mm -hmm. it, should people be afraid of that, or should we just relax? You know, come on. Yeah, people can relax with that. Um, and I understand there's always conspiracy theorists, et cetera. Um, it, you know, the reality of it is that data for the DNR is useful because it not only gives them the number of bucks and does that are shot in your state, but it gives them where they were shot. So they can break that out into the different deer management units. And, and that's what's really important. You know, if we said this year in Michigan, you know, we're going to shoot 100,000 bucks and 100,000 does. Well, that's a little meaningful. But if you say, hey, here's how many bucks we shot in each of the counties mm -hmm. and in each of the DMUs, and here's that's what's really valuable, and that's why the DNR wants that location data. They're not looking to track somebody specifically or say, all right, Mike, let's see, you know, like, where'd you go? I'm going to go check that gut pile. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're doing something wrong, they might go out and, you know, and search that area a little bit. Yep. But for anybody who is, you know, law-abiding hunters, and the vast majority of us are, those people, you don't need to worry about that at all. That just ensures that the DNR has that harvest data tied to a deer management unit so that that gives them the best ability to be successful managing deer. That's how they figure out in the future how many antlerless deer we need to take in this area, mm -hmm. you know, and how the health of the deer herd is doing. So, um, yeah, so it's not like they're going to come follow you around. You know, they're not going to check all that. That's just to ensure that they get the best data they can to do the best job managing deer. So abide by the law. Don't worry about that at all. And it, it, you, you hit the nail on the head with what I wanted you to say. Because, like I talked about Iron County, right? Um, I'm hoping to see, and I don't know, maybe they'll provide a map or, or something with pins or something, but I want to see the southern half of the county have more um, where I believe there are more deer than the northern county, like they have been saying, to prove the point. Say, so, yep, yeah, you know, we haven't had many up to the north, so we're, we're kind of right because there's more to the south. And that's the way it should be. And I'm hoping this is the data that can provide it in a, in a map form that you can pull up a county and go, look, everyone well, was. When we used to go to the, the check stations, yep. uh, up until this, now we, we're no, no longer going to do that. But we would put, take, uh, take a plat book, or not a plat book, but they'd take a county book out and it'd have all of the sections, township sections. And you'd say, okay, I'm in section 12, 13, 14, whatever. And that, they'd put a mark there. So it's a square mile. So what's the difference? Uh, I, you pinpoint to a square mile that's pretty specific so right so everybody kip adams says relax enjoy the <laughs> enjoy your harvest put a pin approximate where you took it help the deer now out and i think we're going to like the results another question um i i ha i know this is true because i read it on facebook you did your homework this i week. know right um so there was a a, a post and somebody went off on the, the Amish community in Michigan is not going to report any of their deer. This is why I don't have any deer in my county because I shoot everything. So, with that being said, Michigan has about 11,000, roughly, Amish people. Whereas Pennsylvania's got like 75,000. So, I'm going to ask you, in, in a situation like that, how would, you, how would the DNR go about... But do they throw a swag in about it, or how do they look into that? They, they still have to report like everybody else. So the law doesn't say, you know, you have to report your deer unless, you know, you live in an Amish community, you know, or unless you live here or there. You have to report your deer. 
you know, if you buy a hunting license, you're going hunting, you got to report it. So I, I get it because uh, we, as you said, we have a lot of Amish um, in Pennsylvania. I live right on the Pennsylvania, New York border. I live two and a half miles from the border. There's a big Amish community just across the line in New York. So you know, I see buggies go by my house every day and we hear the exact same things here. They shoot all the deer, they do this, they do that. The reality of it is they, you know, they're hunters. And in some cases, yeah, they take a bunch of deer, but they still have to report them as well. And there's more than one way to, you know, to report deer. So, you know, whether they choose to do it, you know, through the internet or a phone or somewhere else, they still have to report them like everybody else. So, which is a good thing. Yeah, I think uh, Chad Stewart said that they're going to actually try to get some officers to go into those communities and help facilitate uh, the reporting of the deer. Because, I mean, obviously it's a different lifestyle. The technology uh, doesn't translate to their community. So um, they're, they're going to make an effort here in Michigan as well. So, uh, Danny, it looks like uh, people here said they're going to drop their pin on your house. So I mean, you <laughs> might wind up with about 20 deer taken out of your house. I'm going to have a lot of deer taken out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Remember, I was the quiet guy yeah. when, when I'm being led away in cuffs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. And then I'm just going to say, Live on, Kip Adams. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, no, we're, we're excited about this. I mean, when we started talking about this, I hunted in uh, Illinois. I want to say it was 2017, 16, 17, 18, somewhere in there. And that was the first experience I ever had with reporting uh, Telecheck for uh, a, a deer that I had taken. And then I did it again in Indiana three years ago. And it's really easy. I mean, it's, it's a simple, it, theirs was phone calls. But now we're going to put it right on your phone. It's an app. Bang! You just you go through the checklist and, and answer the questions, and, and you're done. I don't see what the angst is all about, but I am really, really excited to see what information we can glean out of this and where it goes. You know, from here. You know, what's the next step? What do we, what do we get out of this later on? You know, I, do you have you talked to any game agencies uh, about maybe some kind of future uh, information that they might be possibly be able to get out of this? Yeah, you know, from a from a deer management end, it's great because you not only get that in season stuff, but you get the uh, numbers and for the true locations of those pins. You know, it gives you the ability, particularly from a, a state land perspective, but you know, you, you can do it in private land as well. You have research projects where all of a sudden, you know, you can start looking at, you know. Um, GIS systems on, hey, what exactly are the vegetation features around, mm -hmm. you know, where these deer are being killed? You know, if you're in an agricultural area, all of a sudden you find, like, hey, maybe the vast majority, you know, are harvested in young forest or mm -hmm. in, you know, forested areas. Or, you know, if you're in an area that's mostly forested, hey, you know, we're seeing, you know, the majority of our deer being harvested in open air, whatever the case is. So beyond just the straight deer management potential for this, there's all kinds of research potential in order to continue to learn more about how deer are navigating these landscapes, which then you can share with hunters to help them be more successful. So, you know, there's lots of possibilities here. And I will say this, so we've talked thus far mostly about advantages to the state wildlife agency with us. Mm -hmm. You know, a big advantage to hunters that if you haven't hunted under one of these systems, you may not realize is just simply the ability of, okay, I shot this deer, I have registered it now, Hey, all questions are done. Yeah. Um, perfect example. I was in Maryland two weeks ago for the opener. I had my young son there. Um, he shot three does while we were there. We were super lucky. Maryland has a system. Literally, before we left the kill site, I'm on my phone. I'm on their online. I registered the deer. He shot two deer the first night, one deer the second night. They were all reported to the DNR before we ever left. So wow. what that means is, Hey, if somebody pulls us over, you know, they're in the back of a truck going down the road, you know, before it'll be like, okay, have you reported this yet? Where are you going to report this? Let's make sure you're going to be legal. Now, if we get pulled over, hey, check the records. They can look, oh, you've already followed all the laws. Thank you right. for being a hunter. Have a good night. So Absolutely. it's a huge it's a huge benefit to hunters as well, where suddenly, hey, you have had an opportunity to show you're following the rules, you know, you're being a good sportsman or sportswoman, we're playing along. Mm -hmm. So it's just, that's, that's a big benefit to hunters that, you know, they may not be thinking of, they may just be looking at this as an inconvenience, but uh, it's, it's simple, you know, it doesn't cost you anything, right. and it's very quick to do. So there's, it's nothing but benefits for hunters. 
it, it, well, that, well, that's it, right? It, it's, it's both sides here. We've been asking for it here in the state of Michigan. You've been here in the state talking about it. You know, it, it, you, people, it's our first full year of mandatory. This is what you wanted. Mm -hmm. Let's look. Let's let, give it a whirl. Let it run its course. Let it run its course. And talking to Kip tonight, you know, if this is the gold standard that Michigan's come up with, mm -hmm. you know, how can it not be a boon for the state of Michigan yeah. going forward? Right. You know, like, there's a question out there. And, Kip, you know, uh, the, would dropping a pin lead to a potential future hunting ban for a county that shows an over-harvest of deer for management purposes? Would, do you think it would lead to a ban, or do you think it would just be maybe less, if, if they thought they took too many does, they might bring down less permits. less permits, correct? Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. Yeah, it wouldn't be a ban. It, it would just be, you know, a better management scenario. Mm -hmm. So, situation where, okay, yeah, we maybe over-harvested in, say, you know, Ionia County this year. Well, next year, it would allow them to know, okay, here are, here's the system we have in place to try to manage a stainless harvest. We have seen from our data last couple of years that we're over harvested. Let's tweak that so that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it just provides, you know, a finer uh, management strategy to the DNR, which obviously helps the deer herd and then ultimately helps hunters. So, yeah, it's not going to be a ban. It will just allow them to make better decisions from the DNR's uh, level, which as hunters, that's what we want. We want yeah. them to be doing a good job. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And that, that perfectly said. And it is, all their inf information is instantaneous where they can make that decision for the next season instead of, like, say, just well, throwing a dart at it. Right, like like a June, July swag, and here we go mm -hmm. kind of. Nope, we're going to know it uh, in the springtime, just like Kip in Pennsylvania, April. We'll, we'll know it sometimes about then as well, and then yeah. they can make a couple months' decision in that race. Uh, recommendations, right? Yeah. So uh, we're coming up on our last break. we yeah. got our, our final questions for Kip here, so when we come back, we're going to ask him. All right, we're going to step outside, take a break. We'll be right back after this. All right, folks, last segment of the show. Uh, we're going to line up these questions, and we're going to ask Kip, uh, and we're just going to start right at the top here. Uh, I want to come out with a, a leading oh, question go ahead. on this, and then we'll, we'll take those. All right, we've got about 15 minutes here, so. All right, here we are. Welcome back. Fourth segment of the show. Uh, we've been talking about the mandatory deer check, a lot about that, about how it's going to help us, how it's going to help the DNR, how it's going to help the deer. So hopefully this is going to be a win-win-win. Uh, Kip, I'd ask you, you know, how can we, we look into the future and see maybe some instances of this getting uh, going further? And something that just popped into my mind because uh, uh, Danny and I and you were talking uh, before the show about EHD and some recent outbreaks. Uh, is that something that maybe we could report in the future, like, you know, a pin drop of where EHD is, and you could see if it's spreading, you know, through certain areas or not? I mean, is that something that's a possibility? Well, I think there's there's lots of possibilities to, to provide information like that to the DNR, and there's more states taking more advantage of citizen science like that where they're, you know, listening to what folks are seeing. So, um, yeah, anything like that can can help facilitate data getting to the DNR and from a hemorrhagic disease then you know they have to get their hands on those deer very mm -hmm. quickly to be able to get a sample that's not spoiled you know to test for us so okay. um, so yeah you know there is, I can totally see a system like this where people can not only call in to report it but you know they can show them exactly where it is yeah. or maybe an animal they see that's rabid or an animal they see that's acting strange that's you know that's still mm -hmm. moving that you know won't be there you know, if an officer comes out, you know, they can drop a pin on where it was. So, yeah, there's, there's lots of opportunities like this to help hunters become more engaged with the agency, um, the management side, the law enforcement side. So, um, yeah, I can see all those okay. as being uh, positives. You know, and another positive, I'm looking at the app right now on my phone, is that you can do a one-touch to report all poaching. So you don't have to look for the phone number, don't have to write it down. You know, you can. I've got it in my phone. <laughs> well, yeah, literally, the, it's, it's on speed dial. For the half happy people. Yeah. You know, you just click a button and away you go. So, but um, you know, possibilities are endless when you start going into into this absolutely technical age. Uh, question for you, Kip. On the website, you are known as Chief Conservation Officer. So the question is, 
since your title is chief conservation officer, is that the same as a con conservation officer, like police officer, or no? That that is not, and um, I get I get ribbed about that a little <laughs> bit by some of my former colleagues who are law enforcement officers. Um, prior to the merger, um, I was a QDMA's director of conservation. Uh, when we merged and became the National Deer Association, um, all of our employees at, at my level, rather than directors, we became chiefs. So, you know, we have obviously our CEO, our, our chief financial officer, our chief development officer. Well, since I run our conservation program, rather than director of conservation, because I'm a, I'm a wildlife biologist by training, mm -hmm. I became the chief conservation officer. So, um, and uh, I did a podcast shortly after the merger with some friends from uh, New Hampshire, actually former law enforcement officers. Oh, boy. Who have a, and so uh, that's what they said. Kip, you know what? And they knew. I mean, they knew know that I'm – they said, so, like, so after all these years as a wildlife biologist, now you finally become, you know, a, a wildlife officer, a conservation officer. So mm. they had a good laugh about it. But, no, for me, I'm, I'm a trained wildlife biologist. I work in the conservation side and the biology side, and uh, yeah, no, no law enforcement training uh, at all. Certainly, have a lot of respect for our law enforcement folks, but uh, Amen. I don't have any training in law enforcement. All right. Next question: Does the NDA uh, typically att uh, attend trade shows? Uh, do they do public shows? I'm, I'm assuming that's probably up to the local branches if they want to go into those shows. We have a lot of local branches that do local trade shows, and certainly Michigan, probably more there than anywhere else. But many of our branches across the U.S. go to uh, trade shows. From the national organization standpoint, we always go uh, to the ATA and to the SHOT Show. We always hit those two. We occasionally will hit some others, but uh, we're, we're always at those. How is, uh, next question, how is CWD looking in Pennsylvania, and how, do, how, how does the uh, how, how's it looking there for the outlook for Pennsylvania for, with CWD? Well, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it continues to spread. Um, we, we've had up to seven different disease management areas now. Um, the good thing is there's more hunters engaged on that topic and knowledgeable about it than ever before. Uh, part of the problem is five of our seven disease management areas are the result of a captive deer farm that tested positive. So, uh, you know, it started there not in the wild. It was in captivity, and... You know, the unfortunate thing is there are, you know, tens or, or hundreds of thousands of hunters in those areas that have been negatively impacted, mm -hmm. you know, because of that. So, anyway, um, it does continue to spread. Um, there's there's a bigger fight today than ever before to help limit that, which uh, which bodes us, I think, well for the future. All right. Are you allowed to bait in Pennsylvania? Cannot. Cannot, nope, bait. Can, cannot bait anything. No, can't bait deer, can't bait bear. Obviously, can't bait ducks or doves or anything like that. So, yeah, the, there are some urban deer zones that do allow you to debate, but uh, that, the, that's a very tiny number. So 99% of Pennsylvania, um, you, you can't bait anything. Okay. Um, how? Do, what's the, the thought on um, the, the synthetic uh, sense as opposed to the real urine? urine? Yeah. In Pennsylvania, you can still use real urine outside of disease zones. If you're in a disease zone, you cannot. That has to be synthetic. Um, our take on that is, you know, the actual infectious materials in, in deer urine is so minute. Um, for example, saliva is about 10 times, or the infectious materials in saliva is about 10 times as much as urine. Uh, the infectious materials in the muscle are about 100,000 times greater than it is in urine. So... States that ban urine are certainly being ultra cautious, and some states just have a zero tolerance, you know, risk factor for that. So, our stance as a national organization is, you know what? There are so many other ways that CWD is more likely to be transmitted than it is in urine. That uh, you know, we we haven't supported urine bans um, simply because there are way more lower holes in the bucket than that natural urine from our standpoint. We totally get it. The states, you know, that, that want to eliminate all potential risks. But, man, for, from CWD being moved around, um, it's far more likely to be moved other ways than with urine. Uh, and last but not least of the random questions. Um, oop, actually, one just popped one in. Um, I don't really think uh, it's the way – the question is it's just the way for the DNR to get more money. I really don't think having mandatory check is, is a way to get more money. I think it's a way to get better better use out of our money. 
Does that make sense? I, I see that. Because you're getting better information, it's going to be better returned to the... I would rather have our officers out patrolling, doing their due diligence out in the field for, for poachers uh, and people doing illegal things versus being at a check station if this ta is taking place of a check station. Mm -hmm. um, I know here in Michigan we've cut back on our check stations, our, our time, how, how often the, the DNR officials or biologists are actually there to check deer in. Those windows are shrinking and, and actual sites are, are going away. Um, and I would rather see those officers out doing what they're supposed to be doing. I mean, does that make sense? I mean, is that on the right track? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think this is not a money making thing at all. I mean, and this is all about better data and data more quickly to the deer biologists so that they can make better decisions and provide that to the public much earlier in the year. Yeah, th this is not, not a money thing at all. Okay. Uh, so, people watching our podcast, they've been, they've been hearing about the Deer Association. How can they help? Um, well, they, they can certainly become a member. Um, nobody fights harder for deer and deer hunters' rights than uh, the National Deer Association. So uh, they can become a member. Um, they can use, you know, go to our website and, and use our materials, you know, to, to help t them learn more about deer or, or how to enhance habitat or, you know, maybe that will encourage them to, to take somebody else to the woods and mentor them. So, um, yeah, if they like deer, uh, I'd, I'd welcome them to check our website out. I think that they certainly will find things there that, that they like. Um, definitely will see something there that helps uh, teach them a little bit more about how, getting, how to get close to these deer in the fall. And uh, yeah, maybe they would uh, join and, and help support uh, us in the fight to, to ensure the future of wild deer, wildlife habitat, and hunting. You know, uh, something I got a question on. Since, you know, QDMA and NDA merged, uh, before that happened, I, was, uh, I, I took the Deer Steward one class and was looking at deer steward two and possibly using our camp as a host site uh for for one of those uh is the nda still doing that program or not we sure are and, okay. and you know we do uh, basically all the same educational programs that we did uh, you know when, when we were qdma before the merger so okay. yeah deer steward is still extremely popular um, in fact, we have added uh, additional Deer Steward modules so that there are more opportunities. People would go through Deer Steward 1 and Deer Steward 2, and they'd be like, okay, what's next? Yep. We, we want another one. So we have continued to develop more of those classes. So, yeah, all of the stuff that I get to do, Mike, that teaching Deer Steward is one of my favorite for sure. So uh, I'm, I'm very proud that we continue those. And, Dan, early on you mentioned, you know, that 15 or 17 million acres of impact. That's where that comes from is, is folks that have been through our deer steward program, you know, that we measure, you know, the acreage that they either own or manage. So since 2007 when we started that program to now, folks who have gone through deer steward, that, that's the acreage the, that, uh, that they manage. So we're, we're super proud. That's an incredible footprint of, of wildlife habitat in our country that, uh, that, that's been impacted by folks who have gone through that program. That was one of the things that I thoroughly enjoyed uh, I mean, I, I, I try to soak up as much as I can about deer, but I got to say, those are the, that, that deer steward class uh, program, I, I s enjoyed that so much. I learned so much about that and tried to employ some of that at our camp. Uh, we've had a bunch of turnover at our camp, and right now we're kind of in a lull, and uh, I, I'm hoping that I can relight a fire in some way to, to get that going again and and, mm. and try to get uh, a, a co-op. I tried to start a co-op, and it was just... It, it's really hard, you know. We're up in in, uh, in big big tracts of land, uh, club land, and uh, you know it's breaking down those barriers and, and those mm -hmm. walls between camps and uh, you know what people you know, their philosophy of hunting. I mean, I watched an 80 year old man in our camp ball his eyes out because we shot too many does, mm -hmm. and you know, and it, I had to have class right there by the campfire. You know, opening night of deer season, and it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's hard. And and I felt for him. I mean, nobody loved deer more than that guy. He absolutely uh, loved them. And it's just it's breaking down those barriers in education. So, mm. uh, well, and that's what kind of Mike and I have evolved as we get into all this stuff is is more of the educating people, getting you on the show, getting Chad on the show, getting the the word out about 
about information, especially when we can get information from like you in other states that says, hey guys, it's okay, mm -hmm. you know, relax, mm -hmm. breathe. Uh, we got Mark in Indiana, you know, we're, we're reaching out and just getting out the information. And like you said, the Deer Steward courses that you have online, you know, you can go check those out over at, at your website. It's just getting that information, teaching and passing it on. So, you know, we're bumping up uh, right, close so to the time you need to, all right, to wrap so here's up what your we're gonna kip. Do. We're going <laughs> to let me take a real quick. Okay, we got all the questions answered. Kip, want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it's been great. We're going to probably a little couple months. We might circle back with you and find out how your hunting went because I really wanted to talk to you about uh, getting your kids out hunting and you out hunting. And maybe we can talk a little bit more, maybe get together, maybe a attack challenge. Yeah, maybe we go to Pennsylvania this year. I'm on it. You know, we can travel to Pennsylvania. Right? So, there you go. Heck yeah. Um, now, I've enjoyed this, guys. Feel free to circle back with me anytime. Uh, I'm glad uh, to, to come back and talk you know, deer hunting or, or whatever you want. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't lose my number. All right. Well, we hope to see you at ATA this year. Uh, if good Lord and willing, creeks don't rise. We're going to try to get our, our tails over there for that. And uh, if we do, we'll stop in and say hello. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if I don't see you before, uh, I'll see you in January, and uh, good luck this deer season. You as well, sir. You, you take care. And, uh, you Thank go, you. We'll let you go now, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right, sounds good. All right, take bye care. Bye see bye you bye guys. Bye. You know, it's uh, it, it's great to talk to like-minded people oh. who, who are, are just got a passion it, it, and it's... dedicate their whole life just to deer hunting. 20 years already he's been over at, like at, over at QDMA mm -hmm. the the deer association and before that he was a biologist in New Hampshire yep you know and it, it just getting these people on the show I think as we look at it and talk um, getting his knowledge out um, Chad Stewart's knowledge out you, you know what I've learned in the last month um, you know about the mandatory deer but also the the where our hunting should really focus on yeah it's not the kids it's it's yeah. that 20 30 something yeah which, which makes at. complete sense and you know when he first said that i was kind of like hmm but you know the more he, chad talked about it and then tonight with kip it, it, it makes complete sense you've got to get people who've got the means and the access to get out and do it and teach Ab them so. absolutely and, and, and thanks tom ginzel thanks for the, for the comments yeah and, and tom ginzel don't worry uh you, we know Tom. Come on, they always have food and drink. You're in, right? That's so, right. <laughs> it, it, it's and, and don't give away your secret spot. I know, I get it, but um, I just, you know, reach out in your state if you're listening in another state. Mark Coleman can reach out in Indiana to the local branch there. We've been to a, a few of these. Um, whether it was the co-op up north, mm -hmm. uh, we've been to let them go, let them grow. Um, we've been to a. Co I've, the one, Alpina, the, the one up in Alpena, the one up in Alpena Creek. Yep. Matter of fact, um, the guy who started the Anchor Creek co-op up there this morning, he hit a deer with his truck. <laughs> yes, he did. I saw that. So everything's all right. Damaged the car a little bit, but uh, just want to give a shout out that uh, everybody was teasing him, saying, "Hey, you got to report that deer. You got to put a pin drop down. You right. know, you got to burn a tag." So uh, you know, that's another thing. This time of year, right now, when I'm driving in from uh, from from uptown to downtown here to work in the morning and it's dark i'm constantly scanning the sides now i mean because it, it's dark in the mornings when i go to work so it's that time of year man it's it's a good time of year but you also got to be a little cautious when you're on the road i know right and it, it well I, I said it about squirrels mm -hmm. I, i've seen a ton of squirrels run over so they're on the move so it's yep. it's fall right yep uh it's the 21st so small game season has opened up here in michigan i don't know if they're running from bullets or just Looking running. for a nut, right? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, having Kip on is just, it was awesome for him to tell us Pennsylvania side of the mandatory deer check. Um, you know, folks, let's give it a whirl. Yeah, we really don't have a choice. <laughs> it's coming. So just do your part, check your deer in, and, uh, you know, we'll see how this all plays out in here. Before we let everybody go, though, I, I do want to check, because I'm watching the totals increase here. I'm going to give it one last hit here. We started out with 9672, 9672 deer, and we are now an hour and a half later at 9677. So there's been five more deer reported since. And I and I think um, whatever half hour after sunset was the illegal the illegal shooting time. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would be about 
eight thirty, I think is what it is about. Okay. So, you know. Hopefully and, everything's and, been reported. And truthfully, if you're a little bit, you know, if you're a little, a little late, late, come on, they're, you're you're getting it done. Exactly. That's the point. You know, I I get it. it well, there's seventy two hours. Well, come on now, folks. This is mm -hmm. our first year. We already talked to Chad. It's it's going to be a little bit of a learning year for everybody. So, get out there. Do what you need to do because I think this is an opportunity for the deer hunters to say, yes, this is what we want. Absolutely. Now, sure, are there going to be bumps? Absolutely. So, well, I'll tell you what, next week, who we got on? Uh, Dean Smith, who has just recently come back from Alaska. Alaska. Yeah, so we're going to talk to him on a flying hunt. A, a flying hunt. We're going to talk to Dean Smith. We're going to have great some great pictures. Talk about his hunt. Uh, and that will be the last show of september then from there we're going into october wow and then we're gonna have um oh they're not i know we got one for the first week and we're working on that one for the second week yep but i'm hoping we're going to be talking about maybe some kills yeah hopefully so everybody get out there get after it it's coming it's coming quick uh, my plans were to go to camp on the opener october 1st but once again work has possibly reared its ugly head and I may not be able to go. I will be leaving Thursday, <coughs> excuse me, Thursday night or Friday and I should be up in a tree Saturday sunrise, morning. Sun, Saturday morning. Saturday morning. So, well, I hope so. I hope, I hope I'm there with you or not at your place, but at my place and, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. And then maybe later in the month we can get you up to the cabin. I'll be up there for a week, so. All right, well, that'll do it for us this week, folks. Uh, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, make sure you go over to, if you're listening on iTunes, go over and give us a review. That helps us and helps those who help us. And make sure you give us a like, follow, share. Go over to NDA's social media pages. Give them a like, follow, share as well, as well as Kip Adams. And for those of you watching here on the podcast, same thing. Give us a like, follow, share the show for us. Absolutely. And, and last week we had Randy Stop and Hagen on. If you haven't paid attention to our Facebook, he finally connected on a 6x6. Six 6x6 six, six six elk out there in Idaho. A big shout out to him. Thank you, Tammy, for reminding me. A big congratulations. Uh, Mike needs to retire, Mark Coleman says. Mike would like to retire, but uh, certain circumstances is not allowing him to. They're out of his control unless I win the lottery. Right. And, and <laughs> I'll, I'll read between the lines. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and so if you're listening, Facebook Live. Um, if you're catching us on YouTube, it'll be on YouTube in a few days. Uh, if you're watching us and listening to us on YouTube, remember to hit the subscribe button. That helps us as well. That's so, right. Smash that thing. Right? So, with that being said, everybody, you all have a great week. We'll be back next week with Dean Smith talking about flying into Alaska. I love it. All right. We'll be back again next week.